The Thursday, April 11, 2019 regular meeting of the Brisbane Planning Commission will now come to order. May I have roll call, please? We'll do in reverse order. Um, Commissioner Sayasan. Here. Commissioner Mackin. Here. Commissioner Gooding. Here. Commissioner Gomez. Here. The records Sorry. show that Commissioner Patel is absent. Adoption of the agenda. May I have a motion to adopt, please? I make Go a motion move. to adopt. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Consent calendar. We have a corrected draft action minutes for the meeting of March 14th, 2019. There was an error under written communications. Um, so now um, that has been noted. There was, there was none. So may I have a, well, first of all, is there anyone who would like to remove an item from the consent calendar? I see none. May I have a motion to adopt? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Now we have oral communications. Um, is there anyone in the audience who would like to address the commission regarding a matter not on tonight's agenda? I see none. We'll go to written communications. And I have two emails here. One from Beth Grossman dated April 11, 2019 regarding tonight's agenda and also an April 11, 2019 letter from Danny Ames um, concerning the same issue. So that's noted for the record. And um, now we'll turn to the public hearing at issue. Um, could, sorry, yes. quick question. Are, mm -hmm. are we to read it aloud? No, we're going to, um, I think staff, um, we're gonna link it to the, um, to, uh, the agenda for tonight. Yeah, it's part of the discussion you'll be having regarding the public hearing. Okay. So the public hearing tonight concerns zoning text amendment RZ-5-18, and it's concerning uh, zoning text amendments to update the city's density bonus and inclusionary housing regulations contained in chapter 17.31 of the Brisbane Municipal Code pursuant to programs HB4B and HB 5A of the 2015-2022 Housing Element and State Assembly Bill AB 1505. The City of Brisbane is the applicant. Staff, maybe we have a report. Yes, thank you, Honorable Chair and Commission. So the application before you tonight is a zoning text amendment to update our inclusionary housing and density bonus regulations, which are currently housed in chapter 17.31 of the municipal code. Just a summary of your work to date on this issue. Um, you've had several workshops and study sessions um, going back to July of last year on the uh, regula regulatory update that was mandated both by our housing element adopted back in 2015, as well as recent uh, changes to state law, which is the referenced AB 1505, which impacted regulation of inclusionary housing requirements as they apply to rental uh, housing projects. So the draft ordinance before you tonight has several components. Um, we've walked through them at prior workshops and study sessions, but here's a general summary as provided in your staff report. Um, the ordinance before you tonight, you'll notice, uh, first of all, has a different organizational structure. So we are recommending that the density bonus regulations be extracted from the inclusionary housing regulations, basically due to differences in their administration um, and applicability. So uh, in the draft ordinance before you, you'll see the density bonus uh, regulations in a new chapter 17.29 uh, and the inclusionary uh, requirements would remain in chapter 17.31. Um, let's dive right into the density bonus uh, ordinance regulations. So again, in that, as in the draft ordinance identified as new chapter 17.29. Um, the most significant changes to the density bonus regulations uh, are uh, removal of duplication of the density bonus requirements and regulations in terms of the actual 
um, numbers. Uh, we have previously had extensive tables, which were basically just repetitive of what was in the state law. So we've removed those tables and replaced them with references to applicable state law. This is hopefully we'll keep our ordinance as up to date as possible um, as density bonus law and other housing laws at the state level continue to evolve. Hopefully we'll need to uh, have fewer updates to our ordinance over time. Uh, the second uh, significant item is uh, related to implementing our housing element um, programs for density bonus ordinances to essentially create a density bonus incentive for small projects. So these are projects that wouldn't meet the threshold under state density bonus law of five units or more. Uh, so two to four unit projects basically. And what we were directed to do by our housing element program was to create this additional incentive for small projects. Um, and as we've kind of walked through with you guys previously, uh, the solution we kind of are proposing there is uh, really limited in scope to projects in the R2 and R3 districts, again, of two to four units. And the table uh, below is excerpted from the draft ordinance. The other change, the density bonus regulations, um, is to allow an additional incentive or concession for projects that exceed the um, density bonus qualifications in state law. So currently, under state law, projects are maxed out at three um, so in this scenario, a project that was going above and beyond could potentially ask for a fourth. So again, this would implement our housing element policy HB5, oh, sorry, HB4B. And moving on to the inclusionary housing regulations. Um, these are the more substantive regulations just in terms of the differences in um, our methodology. So, um, the first change that's highlighted here is reducing the minimum unit th or lot threshold from six to five. Um, and as is, as is explained in the staff report, that's intended to make um, our requirements fairly uniform. So I think there's an example in the staff report saying a five unit project could um, be eligible for a density bonus or request a density bonus and concessions and incentives associated therein. Um, whereas a project not, um, a five unit project not utilizing a density bonus could simply be built as market rate. Um, so we saw kind of a disconnect there. So that would um, make that requirement a little more uniform. The second uh, item is the introduction of a, a uniform percentage, a 15% inclusionary requirement applicable to for sale and rental developments. So as we've talked about before, our current ordinance has this sliding scale requirement where there's a flat requirement for a range of, of housing unit numbers. Um, the recommendation from staff initially was for rental projects um, adopting a 15% flat requirement to, apply, uh, to comply with state law AB 1505. Um, that law basically says that any ordinance that requires more than 15% inclusionary for rental projects would be subject to review by the state Department of Housing and Community Development and would have to justify with an economic study why that percentage over 15% would not chill uh, the development of housing. And then as it evolved in your discussion, um, this, while we weren't necessarily obligated to or there wasn't a uh, direct uh, mandate to do this, the draft ordinance also proposes a 15% requirement for for sale uh, housing projects. Um, Oh, the other thing before we move on from rental, as we've discussed, the draft ordinance also targets very low income households. So those are households making about 60% of the area median income uh, based on our most current income limit tables. So that's a change from our current ordinance, which for for sale or rental, the only households targeted are low and moderate. So this would be a new component of our ordinance. So again, for the for sale 15% requirement, uh, continuing to target low and moderate income households as the current ordinance does um, with one difference. So what's suggested in the draft ordinance is that for projects of five to 10 units or lots, uh, the 15% requirement be directed to moderate income households. And then for larger projects of 11 or uh, units or lots or more, it would be broken out into 10% affordable to moderate and 5% affordable to low.
The other component of the uh, ordinance that's different is uh, an alternative is provided for rental projects, uh, a buy right alternative, and this is uh, in the form of an in lieu fee. Uh, this is also a response to state law AB 1505, which requires at least one alternative to the uh, construction of units in a project that are subject to an inclusionary requirement. Um, the ordinance also sets forth additional discretionary alternatives. Uh, these would be subject to city council review and approval and basically would put the onus on the developer to demonstrate why a different or reduced or alternative way of constructing, perhaps like off-site construction is one of the options there, would be a better fit for not only the project itself but the city's overall housing goals. So the additional alternatives that are uh, put forth or provided uh, in the ordinance are discretionary. There's no guarantee of approval. So the, that you know, means that the ordinance is weighted towards construction of units, unless the developers of a rental development and chooses to pay the in lieu fee. Um, and then the last component um, would be uh, we also adjusted some of the language in the existing ordinance about adjusting inclusionary housing requirements. The previous ordinance had a provision that basically said a developer could request that the entire uh, inclusionary requirement be waived. Um, it was unclear to us the reasoning behind that language. Uh, it kind of referenced a, um, it appeared to reference uh, if the city was unable to prove a nexus between the inclusionary requirement and um, market rate housing, the developer could challenge us in some way and we talked with the city attorney and agreed that our ordinance clearly establishes the nexus between why we're requiring inclusionary development to begin with. So we kind of modified that existing section to um, gear it more towards um, adjusting the requirement to perhaps target different income groups or provide other adjustments of the requirement um, but not waiving it entirely. Uh, and then the last thing the staff report discussed was the issue of uh, fees. So we've talked uh, about the linkage fees that are possible that other cities have adopted in the county. These would be fees assessed to market rate residential developments or new commercial development um, that would fund affordable housing, either construction of affordable housing in the city or other affordable housing programs like down payment assistant loans or um, other, other types of financial assistance to actually achieve affordable housing uh, policies. So that type of fee wouldn't necessarily be part of a zoning ordinance discussion, um, at least not in the context of tonight, um, other than our recommendation to have the inclusionary in lieu fee, nexus fees would kind of be its own animal. City council would ultimately be the you know, setting the policy for whether we wanted to adopt such a fee and if so, what kind of programs it would fund. Um, but that is something that, you know, we know you guys have been very interested in learning more about and had been part of your discussions moving forward. So um, we'd be happy to answer any questions about that. So okay. I will wrap up my staff report there. We're recommending um, that you recommend city council approval of the draft ordinance by adoption of the resolution. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, we'll start with Commissioner Gomez. Do you have any questions for staff? It's more related to these two letters here and what, based upon the uh, continual discussions that we've had, uh, is confusion about what we're actually doing right now and what these letters <coughs> articulate here. Um, and I just wanna make that very clear. We're, we're talking about the existing built Old Town Brisbane updating the ordinance with an effort to have more affordable housing essentially within the current developments that are happening within the Old Town Brisbane, the zones R2 and R3. Is that, is that well, and maybe you clarify the ordinance will apply citywide, but as we've discussed, the ordinance. Um, doesn't preclude the city as part of a uh, development agreement negotiation on the Baylands right. to require a higher um, affordability component. It's going to create a floor, and 
you know, again, part of these issues were to increase the sort of um, reach of what it applied to, which more likely catch projects that are smaller that occur in central Brisbane. But also a lot of what we're doing here is trying to bring our ordinance into compliance with state law. And I just wanted to clarify that um, we did receive these two letters and um, I thought about reading them as requested by the two people that wrote the letters, but we don't want to set a precedence where if let's say I receive 10 letters, am I going to read 10 letters? You know, we're, we're, right. so we thought that in the, in, in the interest of public, you know, um, disclosure that we could link it to the city's website so that anybody that wanted to read it could read it. So okay. any other questions, Ms. Uh, Commissioner Gooding? Um, I had one sort of general question about historical path of this. Has the city had enough in lieu fees received over the you know past few years that anything specific has been done with them or any, any program has been created for them? We do not have an in lieu fee currently. So. Just to clarify, the city used to generate um, money, revenue for affordable housing through redevelopment. Right. But once redevelopment uh, was eliminated, that that source of funds okay. was uh, came to an end. Right. Thank you. Commissioner Mackin. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, to thank staff for reviewing some of the things we covered in workshops and echo what Commissioner Gomez said is that a lot of the workshops we had much of what we covered has evolved to this state and one of the important things we learned is that within Brisbane most of the housing that has been built is infill housing they're usually three units or less they're small contractors and our concern was we all hear the mantra of affordable housing and housing crisis and to the disdain of a lot of people, how much of that is ever affordable? And within Brisbane, despite whatever you believe about housing, we've heard over and over, um, people here are still concerned about finding, retaining affordable housing. And one of the opportunities we saw with going through the workshops was to try to promote more affordable housing with our infill housing and how you go about doing that. So that's kind of the genesis behind this. And um, the idea, um, I, I'd like to have John, you and I had a little discussion about setting regulations versus incentives. So that's something I, I felt was very, um, mind opening on this as how to actually get developers to consider it and additionally just pulling out from one of the letters if there are incentives are those incentives determined by staff or does that come back to the planning commission that's something I'd like to know um, and about ADUs how they fall within this but I, I appreciate what you've gone over so far as the context of how we arrived at this point because we had many workshops and many prolonged discussions of, of how to incentivize getting more affordable housing within Brisbane and the Baylands are a whole different story. So, I'm sorry, can you clarify your question? Were you referring to the density bonus term, the incentives and concessions, or are you referring to separate the, the term incentives and okay. and would those come so, back before the planning commission so the way density bonus law works at the state um, a, pr a developer can if they are providing the amount of affordable housing or special needs housing or whatever it may be under state density bonus law that they need to get these incentives or concessions um, they request those as part of their development design so say the incentive is Sure, reduced parking. They would provide a design that has, you know, 60% of the parking that would otherwise have been required. Um, so they're they're integrated into the project design and, you know, identified by the developer. This is what we're requesting. Um, and John, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but as long as they are compliant in all other aspects, we are, have no grounds to reject incentives or condition uh, or incentives or concessions unless they fail to prove that they would actually allow for the economic feasibility of affordable housing development 
or that they actually are physically precluded from building their project unless they're granted such, is that correct? That's correct. And then typically in those kind of projects as part of that, the preliminary review and the discussion back and forth, you know, we'll try to have a, a good discussion with the developer about incentives if they're going to be requesting them and if there's some desire that maybe the city feels some other concession or incentive might be more appropriate for development. We, we can kind of have that sort of discussion and try to have some some meaningful dialogue. But, but yeah, at the end of the day, state law is fairly um, strict in terms of if, if, if they can demonstrate or, you know, or it's actually I'm almost on the city to prove that these concessions or incentives aren't necessary for the project to, to work. And, and they have to demonstrate that in a pro forma and, you know, they can't just say right. it's going to make it cheaper for me. They have to show us. Right. And where would ADUs fall in this? In the context of a density bonus project? Yes. Uh, like allowing someone to build affordable units as ADUs? Mm -hmm. Um, and the density bonus law, if it was like a residential subdivision, if they wanted their, are they precluded from doing that? I think that's up to us. Um, well we had talked about, I think in the that's for sale for product. For inclusionary. Oh, for inclusionary. Um, that's an interesting question. I've never seen an, I've never seen a uh, subdivision detached yeah. homes that actually, uh, was that utilized density bonus law under state law. I'm just not familiar with that kind of project, primarily because of the, well, I'm not sure why, but I'm assuming the, the finances for a developer may not work, but I'm not, I'm not familiar with that type of project. But just having read over the state density bonus law a lot um, in, in doing this update, I cannot think of um, a case where you know, if they were providing affordable units, I think we would still have the discretion to say how those units were provided. So we can, look, uh, as can conversation goes on, I can look for uh, language in our ordinance and in the state law. If you'd like a more specific qu answer to that question, we can do more research. Okay, and, and a final item, uh, Julia, you mentioned the state law that requires if you go over 15% that you have to justify it economically to the state. And I'm going to just circle back to that because that's an important point with all of this in that if we have small developers, one of the problems that staff had told us about is that the developers say they cannot just do a project that's all low income because it doesn't pencil out economically. And when we've talked to staff about lowering the threshold to those three units or less, there's the problem because we have to demonstrate that economically this can be done and that requires a whole study to be submitted. Could you please just touch base on that a little bit again? Sure. So should we adopt a inclusionary housing requirement for rental housing that exceeds 15%? Uh, state law says that we have to basically send a copy of that ordinance to HCD that they would require if we hadn't already submitted it, that we prepare and submit to them an economic feasibility analysis that basically looks at the, imp the increase or impact to construction costs for a typical project, residential project in Brisbane. So taking into account land costs and you know the hard costs and soft costs of development that Josh Abrams, Abrams talked about at our last meeting. Um, looking at the actual economic impact of applying that affordable, so say it's say we lowered the threshold to four units and had a 20% requirement, you know, eventually you have a project that has to provide, say, like half the units as affordable in this hypothetical scenario. Um, the economic analysis would have to show that that would still be economically feasible for the developer, that they'd still be able to get a return on their investment, that they'd still be able to finance their construction and still move forward to, with, with what they're doing. Um, that's very similar to the economic feasibility study that we participated in a couple years ago for the nexus fee study, which we have not yet um, been able to bring to council. Um, but the idea is looking at Brisbane specific development circumstances and specific prototypical projects and, and basically doing a pro forma and seeing 
whether or not that requirement would make development infeasible. And if the economic, economic feasibility study was not able to demonstrate that such a requirement would result in projects still being able to be built, then they would be able to send us back to the drawing board and say, you don't, you don't pass the test, get back to work and give us something that actually uh, developers can use to build. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I have no questions. Um, anybody else have any further questions? Okay, we'll open up the public hearing now. And um, I have um, a note here that Brisbane resident Dana Dilworth would like to address the commission on this issue. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, commissioners. Um, when I look at the ordinance that um, you are responding to, or actually the legislation, it says that we have 10 years to adopt an ordinance, and it gives 10 other things prior to um, the kinds of work, these 10 things prior to the portion that you're paying attention to. So I kind of wonder what's the, what's the rush. Um, now's my prepared statement. I once took pride in being a, res a, a res resident of Brisbane, uh, Brisbane resident because we were special. We cared about the environment, we care about our community. We were better than, and it showed in our laws. We were generous. One thing we required in our general plan is 20% low income units of developments greater than 10 units, not 15%, mostly middle income units as proposed in this regulation. You need to concurrently change the general plan to adopt a lower regulation to be consistent. In reality, this new zoning law only offers 5% low income communities an opportunity to live here. That is not the balance we voted for and that is not how to have a balanced, inclusive, livable town. What is missing here is the fact that when we developed our general plan, we utilized an open space recreation percent um, per resident requirement that exceeded national averages. This proposed regulation overrides our community approved general plan by setting lower standards. Th th this recreation standard and our open space element should be noted in 172920L, quote, development standard, unquote. There's a problem of language throughout this law that overlaps the Brisbane Housing Authority with the council, with the planning commission, with the city attorney and the city manager or assignees uh, using the term city, unquote. This is not acceptable. There should be one legislative unit responsible for this component of low income housing, not various corporations or multiple landowners or city officials with various accounting and reporting methods. It should be an open and public process. We have a housing authority where the details of availability and waiting lists, and I'm saying must be maintained, not the ifs that are in um, section uh, 172950C3 and 173180C3. It only makes sense to go the extra mile to require more low income housing and produce the required feasibility study to show that we will meet the need through higher standards. This ordinance is sloppy and fraught with potential misunderstandings when city employees can make design decisions through quote incentives currently under the authority of the Planning Commission and redefine a unit under 173130D. The definition of a unit without square footage and height limits is an incomplete zoning planning act. I don't think it's in the public's interest to include the language of incentives of producing lower quality, less open space, less parking at the discretion of a city employee, while simultaneously not including the extra units in the definition of the project. This is all information that will either never be disclosed to the public or disclosed after the fact. This is not right. We have a right to a fair and open process. 
since by law every unit is allowed an ADU, how does this zoning change interact with ADU's requirements? There is no mention of requiring any public notices or right to appeal changes to neighbors or interested parties, which is constitutionally protected right. This is not, cannot be a lawful ordinance as written. And I would like to enter into the, um, <laughs> the commission, I was gonna say uh, council's uh, record, a litty, letter from the city of Palo Alto and uh, the uh, city's association of Santa Clara County. And there are two things that I've highlighted that as a 15 group of cities, they support maintaining local control of the en entitlement process. And this is exactly what we're talking about. We urge the state to recognize that city control en entitlements where developers build. Cities should therefore primarily be measured by entitlements when, because these numbers are just disappear in the arena att attainment and not be penalized when funding is inadequate. And the other thing they oppose is the one size fits all approach to housing densities and land use decision making. So I'd like to enter this into the record. Thank you. Thank you. Staff, um, can you address? I would suggest you take all the public hearing. All the and we first, can... okay, then we'll address it later, okay. Um, the next resident that would like to address the commission is Barbara Ebel. Hi, um, I'm going to have to give you more feedback in writing later. Um, but for tonight, I wanted to ask the planning commission how lowering our um, inclusionary housing requirements from nearly 20% in certain parts of the old table to 15% in the new ordinance benefits this community. And I'd, I'd, I'd like an answer on the record. Like, how is that improving? Because if there's some reason, like if there's some rationale behind it that it's going to make our lives better, I'm, I'm willing to listen to that, but I can't conjecture one off the top of my head. Um, in the old housing ordinance measured, I think it was uh, finding D, um, said that, you know, we require very low income housing as a percentage because um, low, you know, moderate income housing can displace the opportunities for very low income housing. And, and I think that's true. And so I'm red. Am I supposed to be red? Okay, whatever. So, so I feel like we really need to watch that low income housing component. And I, I didn't see, it seems like the requirements for low income housing are very low income housing are really minimal. I, I can't agree with that. Um, I know it's a lower burden because very low income housing can be can be you know burdensome for um, developers, but I think we should be drawing a line in the sand in the community. If you can't build it with very low income housing, oops, <laughs> do it tough um, because you know we've got that 114 unit fort sh shortfall in our very low income housing requirements for RENA. And that allows the state to do things to us. If you're, you know, if you wanna look at it from the selfish perspective, um, personally, I look at it from the perspective, perspective of the lowest, those people with the very low income need housing more than anybody else. But if you are a selfish person, there's, there's also reasons to do that. And I think um, if we could yeah, those. I would like to turn that that requirement on its head, rather than requiring one low, moderate income unit, just one low income unit, very low income unit, for these these smaller projects. And if they can't build it, I I can all I can do is shrug, really. 
Um, I read a lot of things about the, and I've talked about this before, about how the car companies, the car manufacturers all squawked and screamed and threw themselves on the floor when the, the government told them they were going to have to include seat belts. It was going to make cars too expensive. They were going to lose market share. You know, it was just, it was, it was too cumbersome. It was going to add, you know, too much money to the, uh, and, um, in the end they learned, they figured out how to do it. And, and I think it's the same thing. I think we have to require these very low income units and developers. And if we keep our ground, developers will eventually figure out a viable, you know, profit model for that cost, balance, income, whatever, however you want to say it. Anyway, I just really am very disappointed that if those things did not get lost. Um, I was also, I have some, a lot of other questions, but I'm going to have to follow up and I'd, I'd like my answer to how reducing the percentage is, is going to benefit this community and um, low income people seeking to live in this community. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the commission? Mr. Ray Miller, please. <coughs> no, thank you. So a couple of uh, observations and questions that I hope will be addressed. Uh, so my uh, first observation is that I, I understand that what you're doing is primarily making our local ordinances consistent with the state law. So I understand that. So that's a given as to the process here. But I did want to uh, reiterate what, what uh, Mr. Sawicki said, that even though you may be thinking about trying to get some more affordable housing in already developed Brisbane, this ordinance will apply to the Baylands. So that needs to be taken into account when you think about all its implications. So I want to make that clear, and I think your own planning director has pointed that out. A second is just a um, kind of a procedural thing that's being recommended that seems to me is not terribly friendly to the public trying to look up something. And that is moving the information on the different kinds of or different levels of density bonus uh, to the state law. On a, somebody would have to look it up online to find out what the state law says rather than finding it on the Brisbane website. At least that's how I understand it. And so it strikes me that though that's practical, it's not terribly friendly to Brisbaneites who are trying to find out. So what are the rules on density bonus and how many additional units can you get for such and so? And, and then it says, go to such and such code and such and such state law. And that's not terribly friendly. I mean, lawyers can do it, of course. Uh, but for other people, that's kind of difficult. And so I just make that as a suggestion for, you know, be kind to people who are trying to look things up. Um, the other thing that I find quite interesting about this that you haven't at least talked about a lot tonight or in the information you have available for tonight's meeting, and this has been discussed a lot uh, on the Internet these days, because when people talk about SB 50, you know, Wiener's uh, current legislation that's under consideration, a lot of the ideas in there for increasing density, for lowering parking requirements, uh, for doing away with setbacks, uh, for increasing floor area ratios and so forth, a lot of those ideas that are in SB 50 already in the density bonus legislation. And it even says in some of the places that uh, the developers can seek changes in the development standards, which I just mentioned. And it is not clear to me under our density bonus ordinance, in light of what it already says in state law, 
what kind of flexibility developers have in trying to get changes in these development standards. If they follow what state law allows, then they can basically say, as I understand it, to the city, this is what state law allows. If you don't allow us to do it, we'll sue. And if we win, we also get you to pay the fees. I think that is the density bonus laws now. And so it's not clear to me uh, how this particularly uh, onerous burden for the city plays out. And I think that's important, again, not so much for small developments in town, but for the Baylands. Because it's going to apply to the Baylands. And there you got a developer with big bucks, with big lawyers, and you know they're going to find a way to, to use state law. And so you need to really be sure that we're as protected as best as we can be. And the final point I'd like to make is something I've uh, asked in the past, but have never really gotten an answer to, to the best of my knowledge. In the general plan amendment, it says that there will be a range of 1,800 to 2,200, and this will take into account uh, density bonuses. The problem in my mind is that our density bonus law, which is consistent with state law, if the developer makes all of the right applications, they can get a 35% density bonus increase in the number of units. Well, 35% from 1,800 is 2,430. That's more than 2,200. And I've never heard an explanation for why we think we can keep things to 2,200 when the state law essentially mandates the possibility anyway of 2,430, even if the developer sticks to, to the low number. And good luck with that even. So anyway, those are questions that I've been trying to get answers to. And I think as a commission, you should have answers to before you go ahead and pass something and recommend it. Because these are things I think the people in the community and certainly the council when they face this uh, need to have answers to so they can feel comfortable that they're doing something that's in the best interest of the town. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address him? Please. Please state your name. Daniel Ames, oh. Brisbane resident. Uh, you got my letter. Yeah. I was thinking about reading parts of it, but um, you know, I read this 54 page document that you all got, and I'm having a hard time sort of digesting this. I'd like to say, wait, hold the brakes, don't do anything, because I don't really understand what, what the impacts are. You know, I know we even amended the general plan, but I was listening to Julia really carefully, and I got a better handle on it, but I don't think you should make any changes yet till there's a better understanding of what this means and the impact. And as Ray mentioned, uh, are there some hidden uh, liabilities with the developer on the balance? I'd like to know more about it myself so I can arm you guys with my support, verbally or otherwise. So. You know, I feel really naive, and I just I can't make an intelligent uh, advisement one way or the other. I need to learn more, and, and maybe if we can have a meeting where maybe Julia teaches us a little bit more, or the attorney can teach us a little bit more about these are the reasons why. Um, otherwise, I think we're going to have a more divisive town if you're just you know going off half cock. We have to do this intelligently, and we have to make sure that the town's folks really knows what's going on, as well as yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Deanna, you would like to address the commission again? Thank you, Madam Chairperson. And um, I didn't know how much time we would have. Um, I am looking, I believe it was an op-ed, an editorial comment um, about a tr uh, transit-oriented development in Mountain View or Menlo Park, and remember it began with M, where um, the the current um, density units were um, allowed, and the complaint about it was that the luxury units, and this is a problem with just using the word unit and not defining it by size, is that the luxury units uh, in this particular 
uh, enormous um, uh, building were um, the luxury units were eight and nine bedrooms each, which speaks to workforce housing. And actually, yes, you do need to have some component of that. But the um, affordable units were meager at best. They were one bedroom and studio units, and they were separate from the luxury condos up above. And I really think that this ordinance is setting a, a, a two-tiered, uh, two-classifications of housing, and it doesn't meet the need that we need, which is very low and low-income housing. And, and really find this 15%. Um, it says greater than 15%, not 15%. So I really find this whole developer-driven language to be very specious. It's because we will end up creating stratified housing. And that one of the issues here in Brisbane was to not have your low-income housing being, oh, you got the low-income unit, that, that low-income um, families could be integrated into the community, not stratified in a building. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Barbara? Just in case I don't get to that follow-up email, um, I'd like to see staff do like an actual comprehensive table about what this could do to the Baylands and what it could do to Parkside. Because, I mean, we've already had some little surprises here. I mean, I got up here not so long ago and asked um, one of the density things not to go forward. I think Julia remembers. Um, just because I'm very nervous about jumping the gun because uh, there's just more stuff coming down the pike all the time. And I know we have to do this to um, meet SB 10, or sorry, 1505, I think it was. Um, but I'd, I'd like to see it really spelled out for us what, what it's going to do to the uh, park side and what it's going to do to the Baylands. So that we can know what we're getting ourselves into. I mean, that's really the issue, isn't it? We want to know what's going to happen. We can't embrace change when we don't know what it brings. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, I think that's all the public comments. So um, we have a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. A second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, do we want to have staff address some of these first and then we'll follow up? That'd be helpful. Okay, John. Um, who do you want to start with first? Um, what's the what's the commission's pleasure? Well, okay, let's start with um, order. Well, let's start with um, Barbara Barbara Ebel's comment regarding the reduction from twenty percent down to fifteen percent. I'm going to have Julia kind of walk through maybe what that. Um, what the current ordinance does so we're all clear on what the difference is because I'm not sure that that's an accurate characterization to say it's right. a flat that's 20 to 15. Yeah. So I'm going to pull up the current ordinance as soon as your projector cooperates. So this is our current ordinance 17.31 and this is in the section 17.31.030. So this is showing our current requirements for sale project requirements in the first two columns and rental project requirements in the uh, third and fourth. Um, so currently for for sale projects, uh, the target households are low and moderate income households. For rental projects, the target uh, household incomes are very low and low. And the percentage, well, again, it's 
not a straight percentage, it's this range. So for example, for a six unit project, the requirement is one unit, which I believe is That's a 17% requirement when you do the math. Um, for an 11 unit project, uh, the requirement would be two units, which is an 18% requirement. For a 15 unit project, it would also be two units, which is a 13% requirement. So you can see how the existing ordinance, again, it says if you are a 15 unit project, you have to provide the same amount of inclusionary units as a 11 unit project, even if that percentage ranges from 13 to 18, depending on the project size. So the, the statement of, you know, we don't have a 20% requirement right now. We have a range of requirements that go, I think, to as low as like 12% when you plug in the different numbers to over 21%. That's kind of where the range hits us now, and it depends on how big the project is. The bigger the project, the less the percentage of units as our current uh, ordinance kind of bears out. So the 15% uniform requirement, depending on project size, so say a 15% requirement for an 11 unit project um, may have a lesser, well, let me do the math before I say what that would be. That would be two units. As it works out, it would be exactly the same. So say for an 11 to 15 unit project, 15% uh, of either 11 or 15 is gonna get you two units. So that's the 15% requirement that your, the draft ordinance would impose would not give you a different result numerically than um, what our current ordinance says. Um, again, that's gonna vary as the project size varies, but um, we're, try we're trying to get as close as we could to the existing percentages, acknowledging the fact that because we're doing a flat percentage, it would be slightly different as applied to different size projects. Um, and then the other comments, I think, um, related to meeting the needs of very low income households. So our current ordinance does, for rental, split the requirements between very low and low with it weighted towards the low. So the draft ordinance before you kicks out any low income uh, requirements for rental projects and instead converts that to all very low income. So in the draft ordinance actually has a higher requirement for very low income uh, housing than the current ordinance. Was there another question that, or comment that you had related to that? No, I think that's, that's all I noted. Um, does anyone else have a comment about that? Well, Julia, maybe you want to clarify in terms of the for sale? The sure. Um, for for sale projects, so again, our current ordinance splits the requirements between low income and moderate income households weighted more heavily towards the moderate income households. The draft ordinance would have the same approach for projects of 11 units or more. Um, and for smaller units, uh, some, sorry, for smaller projects, um, it would be entirely weighted towards moderate income households, so that is a slight difference uh, between the two. So, I can find it, I'll show you the difference. So again, as stated in the staff report, this would impose a 15% requirement to for sale projects of up to 10 units or between five and 10 units um, affordable to moderate income households. And then once it kicks over uh, 11 or more, it would be split uh, moderate and low. So again, it's a similar structure to the existing ordinance. It's just slightly changed to again, reflect the actual straight percentage versus this kind of sliding. Requirement. So overall, it seems like there's a, a benefit that this change is having a benefit in, in, to providing more low-income housing. 
for rental projects, I think it is a significant change again. So to have all of your required affordable units be targeted at that very low income household and the staff report references uh, as Barbara did the uh, our arena requirement for very low income households we have not been able to achieve that um, as of yet and the whole premise behind staff's recommendation to have the rental inclusionary units be entirely very low income was similarly motivated and as Julia pointed out that if someone had a rental project for example and for whatever reason they wanted to do a mix of low and very low there's the um, flexibility in the ordinance to allow the council to vary that yeah to that. adjust that and they would basically need or they the developer would need to demonstrate that you know that alternative um, income targeting would you know better meet the city's needs at the time so whenever uh, you know if we're in a different arena cycle and we have different requirements or circumstances change in the city maybe we just have a wonderful 100% very low income development that satisfies all our very low requirements but we still need to meet our low it gives the council that flexibility to adjust these requirements based on what are our needs at the time and you know based on a developer's request thank you does anybody have any comments regarding that no oh Commissioner Mack if I could ask staff couple comments that were made where a lot of these new targets fall into the moderate range tell us why we did not go into low or lower income ranges and for for sale yes well again our existing ordinance targets low and moderate and I think the reason that we flesh out in the staff report I'm imagining although I wasn't here in 2009 that it's similar reasoning for sale you know buying a house even if it is a you know lower priced home targeted towards people making less than median income um, there's still a pretty formidable financial barrier in the form of a down payment so even for a $300,000 home that's a $60,000 down payment it's tough for a lot of lower income folks to put that for a lot of non low income folks either to put that money together depending on your circumstances but um, the burden is typically higher to enter into home ownership so typically for sale inclusionary requirements are towards those kind of higher earning lower income households the moderate and low income categories just because it's kind of recognizing that fact that that's really the population that's probably going to be uh, best prepared or even interested in owning a home whereas rental you know uh, it, it's a much lower barrier you usually need first and last month's rent um, so I'd, that's kind of the theoretical reasoning behind that but again in addition to just being consistent with our current regulations too could you also um, in terms of what in the past couple years has been built a lot of this infill housing that we have um, address whether that has been rental or for sale housing do we have any kind of stats on that um, so like the numbers that I showed you at the last workshop mm -hmm. yeah. do you want me to pull them up say I, I know what they were for the recent housing element because we just looked at that. So this is a excerpt from the March 14th uh, staff memo um, which shows our building permits issued for residential uh, units from 2014 to the end of the year in 2018 um, so the big so they're, they're color-coded so you can see that for the most part um, single-family homes and accessory dwelling units dominate and I know that the three unit and I know the colors are kind of hard to see we basically had one triplex in 2014 and one triplex in 2017 and those were both for sale if I recall 
yeah, the triplex on Mariposa, they came back for their condo. Yep. Um, and then the one on Santa Clara at San Bruno also was a condo, so for sale project. Um, we did have planning entitlements that are still active for rental projects. Um, 23 San Bruno, which is four rental units uh, over on a uh, commercial first floor. Oh, and 124 San Bruno. Uh, my apologies, that was a triplex. That was a condo as well for sale. So the answer is we're typically seeing ownership for sale products being designed and approved. Um, condos can be rented and often are, even if someone else owns them. So it is hard to tell for condo projects uh, how many are actually owner occupied. Does that help? Yeah. Or did that model? Yeah. So just a couple other things. May I go a little bit further here? Um, Dana Dilworth had brought up low income units being stratified in a building with smaller units. Any comments on that? In that if we're dealing with a specific property and someone's going for a density bonus, is it is it possible? I, I remember the language said that they didn't have to be the same size or the same. Julia thing. has pulled up, pulled up the language from the current okay. ordinance. Well, for inclusionary. So is that what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, currently the ordinance has a section called inclusionary housing incentives. Mm -hmm. The draft ordinance retains that. I think we've, I don't know that it's significantly modified. So I'll just kind of let you guys look at the current requirements. They basically say that um, single family detached units don't have to be constructed on the lots the same size as the market rate units. So if it's a subdivision, the market rate units say those lots are 6,000 square feet and the uh, affordable lots are 5,000 square feet or whatever it may be, that would be permitted um, as this incentive. The second is that the inclusionary units may be smaller in size than market rate units in the same development and it doesn't specify exactly how much smaller. Um, inclusionary units may consist of different unit types than the market rate units in the same development. Secondary dwelling units proposed as inclusionary units shall be required to be rented at affordable rents uh, as specified in an agreement. And then inclusionary units may have different interior finishes and features than market rate units in the same development as long as they are durable and of good quality. So as an example, if the market rate finishes are, I don't know, Italian marble or something for the kitchen, um, that doesn't mean that the affordable units would have to have the same. They could have a different type of countertop as long as they could demonstrate that it's still good quality, durable, and you know, otherwise will work for someone living there for a long time. So that's what's in our existing ordinance, and I can pull up the proposed ordinance just to make sure that that has not changed, and I don't believe we're m suggesting any changes to that, but let's like the right so I think the current wording in the ordinance didn't assign who's making that determination um, so that's typically we say determined by the community development director um, like that's a typical condition we put on permits. So like for a tree removal, that that be subject to the actual species and size be subject to the community development. Uh, there's. And again, practically speaking, the commission would see whether it's a design permit for a project that's implementing uh, an inclusionary project. You know, as part of your planning commission review, you're not typically to the point of reviewing interior fixtures and finishes so we made it very clear this wasn't up to the developers discretion that it was up to the city to determine what was meeting the standard as opposed to the developers discretion so moving along as well um, it was brought up that this could have an effect to Parkside in the Baylands 
Um, so in terms of the inclusionary requirements applicable to Parkside and the Baylands, so, so yeah, so say a developer purchased uh, property in the Parkside Overlay Districts and proposed a residential development that complied with the standards in the Parkside Plan. Um, they could elect for a density bonus under state law. That's not something we could prevent. Um, the inclusionary ordinance, of course, would just speak to how many of those units would be required to be affordable and in what percentages, so it wouldn't give them a bonus. So the only, so the only part of the regulations that would a, a result in an increase in units would be um, if the developer elected to pursue a density bonus. So if we that. take Parkside as an example where there was a specific plan that even had renderings of what some of these units might look like and the footprints conceptual yeah. thank you um, would a developer seeking a density bonus be able to for instance request taller units if they qualify for a density bonus and then they said i can't build this project with the density bonus unless the height requirement is waived then they could request that okay they'd have to show that they couldn't actually accommodate the units without that. Okay, so let me roll the same question back to, let's say it's infill housing in Brisbane and a developer is going to request a density bonus and they say, well, the height limit in here is 30 feet, but I'd, I'd like the density bonus and I'll do the, the middle and low income, but I wanna exceed the height limit that going to trigger it coming back to us they well if it's already in say the r3 district mm -hmm. you would see any multifamily development because you need to approve a design permit for any project of three or more units in our multifamily districts okay and in our commercial districts that allow residential so you would see the project and you would see the design where they are incorporating both the additional density bonus units they're asking for and whatever consent concessions, incentives, or development standard waivers they're requesting, you would see that. Um, you would see their economic feasibility justification as to why they need these incentives and concessions, and you'd also need to, uh, they'd also need to demonstrate to you that they are physically precluded from building the project with the density bonus unless the development standards, the height limit in this case, is waived. So that's the burden, well, the developer has to show us, they have to show their work uh, for any incentive concession or development standard that they're requesting to be waived. Okay, so let's just for a moment conceptually talk about the Baylands. So let's say that there's a plan submitted for the Baylands and generally there's some agreement as to what the height limit should be in certain areas. And the developer says, I would like a density bonus and so it ends up exceeding that height limit. The concern that Mr. Miller brought up under SB 50 can and the state law and density bonuses, could the developer in fact say, you have absolutely no control over this, I'm meeting all the requirements. You can't tell me I can't do this. And this issue has been kind of hashed around at the council um, and um, you know, the, the, the advice from the city attorney, the best advice for the city attorney as to the, the way to pin down the Baylands project is to have a contractual agreement through a development agreement that both sides and both parties agree to. So what is the development that's going to be allowed out there? And that's the, you know, who, in terms of what state law might say later and how someone might try to break a contract you know, I, I can't speak to that, but that's the, the city attorney's best advice is the development agreement where both parties are, have reached an, a, what they consider an amenable and agreeable solution is the, is the best way to lock in uh, certainty as to how that project develops over time. So if in fact with this ordinance, and as Mr. Miller pointed out, a lot of the, the law governing density bonuses, it's already in place. Correct. I'm just having a hard time here then seeing how we're opening a door with the ordinance 
that we wouldn't have if we did nothing. Does that make sense? So if, if we have I would, I, would, I would agree because the fact is it's taking the development agreement out of play and saying that's not there, that whether or not the city has an ordinance to implement state density bonus law or not, someone can take advantage of state density bonus law. The city doesn't need to have an implementing ordinance. They go, well, you don't have an ordinance, so you don't get to use that provision of state law. They'll be able to use state law provision. Okay. And, and this is a tough one, but I'm going to bring it back. Mr. Miller also a question on the Baylands, 18 to 2,200 2, units. Could a developer, in fact, exceed that with a density bonus? Again, that question was asked in the JJ sort of discussions and the city attorney at that point. Um, they worded the language to be very specific that the intent was to reflect that the, the, the cap reflected uh, density bonuses per, uh, pursuant to state law. Okay. As to the question that was brought up, um, what's the hurry on this? So why are we doing this now? Let's satisfy everyone's curiosity. Well, and Julie you can get into the details, but the requirement to update our inclusionary requirements has been around since the 2015 housing element was adopted. And so maybe the question is what's taken us so long to get here, and maybe we can own that in terms of other priorities and staff and other projects we needed to do and work on from a planning department. Um, and I think we're actually behind the times of when we said we would do this, um, right? Is that true? So our housing element said we would do this by the end of the year 2016. So we are two years later than uh, what we had originally anticipated. Um, so this has been a program since adoption of the 2015 housing element, uh, the two programs. So we are a bit behind our own schedule. Okay. May, I, may I ask <laughs> kind of a, mm, I'm not going to say a dumb question, but I'm just trying to understand, um, and thank you, thank you everybody for all the comments, by the way, because this is just helps with the thought process and, and uh, to incorporate different perspectives on what we're doing here. And I'm just trying to wrap my head around the, the, the points that, that Ray brought up with regards to we've already got um, the state law in place that has certain levers and is pushing us in a certain direction, right? This seems to be like uh, an effort to be, com uh, it's like a compliance effort, right? We're, we, are, we are making a effort to be compliant relative to state law and an effort to um, provide incentives to build ideally more affordable housing for the community, right? That, that's how I understand this. If we don't act on this, which it seems like we're delinquent already because you had, ex the, we're behind, we're a couple years right behind the uh but we haven't been penalized that's what i'm trying to understand well, Are, have HCD we been yeah so this is this, the power no, this, this is what i'm yeah this is where the kind of the dumb question is so what's the penalty of being non-compliant <laughs> well um what it used to be versus what it is now yeah, and what it'll maybe. be next year yeah. i think maybe three very different discussions um, okay. right now we have to do an annual report um, we've reported on our the areas we've made progress and not made progress, and to date, HCD has not called us out on this particular provision uh, that you're delinquent, where are you, where does it stand? Um, does that mean they're going to do the same thing next year? Well, I don't know. I can't guarantee they're going to say next year that it was fine, that we didn't proceed along this path. The recent changes to state law also give HCD the power to, if they want to, pursue legal action against cities that have non-compliant housing elements or right uh, hcd has evolved and is evolving into an actual agency with power right to do things so that is changing and probably will change over time um and of course we'll be monitoring that and keeping you apprised but right local local con oh, i don't want to get i want to stay objective here local control versus state control i know that's a concern 
probably some of you are, are echoing here uh, and for our community members watching on TV. I, <laughs> I know we've covered a lot of this topic. We've, we've had, this is the third or fourth discussion on this topic. Mm -hmm. So I think we've spent a lot of time on it. Um, and my reading of this, and, and with, with all due respect to your input, my reading of this is that we've, we've, we've performed a lot of due diligence with regards to what is required by the state and what we're trying to do here and have an element of local control with, with um, I think it's been a thoughtful exer exercise thus far. It would have been wonderful, and I know we're all busy people, to see, and I know, Ray, you've been involved in, in some of the discussions, but to see more of the community here to have that constructive dialogue as we were moving down this path. That's, that's just an observation, just an observation, and I'm sure we're gonna have more of these types of, of activities as we move forward. <coughs> but as it stands right now, I think we've, I think we have, uh, all right, based upon staff's work here, I think we've, we've looked at, at this particular, um, this particular element, if I can use that language, and I, uh, I think there are, uh, I think there are known unknowns, and there are unknown unknowns. And we're gonna have to really work uh, diligently as as we get into as we get into the Baylands development make sure that we've got the right um, you know contractual arrangements and that we're that we are bringing more people together on these discussions I think my observation is that we have these discussions as a as a commission but we don't necessarily get the robust turnout and I think staff is doing a tremendous job in, in providing the analysis and the reports and so forth so that we're making informed decisions and um, yeah, that's. I just wanted to get my thoughts out because I've just been trying to actively listen during this whole time. So thank you. Thank you. Allow me to do that. Commissioner Gooding, do you have any comments? Minor pretty general. I mean, I, I, since I've gotten from stats report, is that the bulk of the changes to this ordinance are, are if not ministerial, really to to be consistent with state law and avoid the sort of silly task of having to revamp our ordinances every time the state tweaks the, the details of inclusionary requirements and, and density bonuses, which we have to follow and, and just have to. So there's no sense in our revamping the laws every time they revamp, revamp the laws, just so we have the same chart and table that they have in their books. Um, so a lot of that is, is about that, in my opinion. Um, as to the, the, the Baylands elephant in the room, um, I think it's, it's clear, at least to me, that, that this is a floor, not a ceiling and that the specific plan and the development agreement are gonna be much more specific and much more controlling than these minimal requirements. So I, I have no compunction about improving the, the consistency of our ordinances of state law. Thank you. And regarding the Baylands issue, so, so it is true that it is possible the developers can try to seek um, more units beyond what JJ allows um, by seeking a density bonus, correct? So that is a possibility. Not, according to our city attorneys, the, the way the measure was worded um, doesn't allow for that. Can some other developer hire an attorney who has a different opinion? I suspect they can find a, an attorney who would have a, a opposing point of view. Oh, okay. So so regardless, like if, if, if they wanted to create more low-income affordable housing, right now as it stands, we're pretty solid on the law. The city attorney's position is that the, that's a hard cap. Okay. The number's a hard cap. Okay, any more comments on that? If I may. I can, yes. I think for everyone who took the time to come tonight, we do appreciate you coming and expressing your thoughts. They were really good points, really good questions. None of us are totally 100% experts, not from staff, not the commissioners, nobody is. I think the difficulty we're facing here, and it's going to be ongoing, is that what the rules are today can change tomorrow. Your concern is the Baylands. Our concern is the Baylands. When you, we have a city attorney who can give us the best advice possible, that doesn't preclude the state from changing the rules 
a month from now. But what do you do with that? I would ask you the same question. What do you do with that? You have to start somewhere. You have to assume you're getting the best advice possible. That's the due diligence. And what I would suggest is exactly what you're doing right now, sitting in those seats, is coming here and making your voices clear, bringing your questions, but also I'd be picking up the phone and calling all of your representatives because it seems that's what they respond to. They don't respond to Brisbane or our city attorney or what the planning commission decides. It's a lot of politics. You've seen that. And we could, we could triple the size of this document that we have tonight and try to address every nth degree and say, by God, we put all the detail in here. It's, it's just lock, stock, and barrel bona fide. And as John said, they can get an attorney and go, oh, au contraire. This is onerous, and we're going to fight you. So I, I think somewhere here we have to just say it's not a perfect world. It's not going to be. And the best thing as a community that we can do is be vigilant and stay on top of it. And that's what you're doing. And I commend you for that. But I think what you ask of us is we can't fix it and we can't give assurances that you want. We all want a lot of assurances, but they may not be possible. So some of this is trying to put as much thought into it and dealing with it as it comes. Because there, there are a lot of loopholes to many things that we don't know what they're going to be later on. But this is something that, that as Commissioner um, Gomez had said, we've spent a lot of time on it. And it's primarily dealing with central Brisbane. That was a lot of the focus because we were concerned with the housing in central Brisbane and finding affordable housing and a means to encourage that because we haven't had that and that has shown up in the arena numbers. So that's my comment. Thank you. I just want to also follow up on something Ray mentioned about putting more detailed information on the city's website like regarding the density bonus issue and whatnot so that people don't have to go searching for it. We can do that in terms of as a sort of information linkage, but again, it's the idea of putting it in the ordinance and then having to come back if the state changes state law next year and we have to come back and amend the ordinance. That's what we're trying to avoid, but certainly in terms of information available to the public and through the website, we can, we can accomplish that. It, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think the city website already does have some hyperlinks that go straight to the government code and the civil code and for a lot of these things anyway, because that's how I got there when I was rummaging around, so it's, I think in the modern world, a lot of folks can navigate this, but yeah, we yeah we'll double check. It we shouldn't make it harder, but I think it's already there. Okay, I think there are other questions here that were noted. I mean, I don't know how much to go through, but I, I do have a question that um, that uh, Dana Dilworth had also asked about is regarding the ADUs. Now. Um, if a resident wanted to develop an ADU, is there a public notice requirement to that? We're talking about it for a, uh, an ADU as, I'm not sure what the Sorry, so uh, the written uh, letter that mm -hmm. uh, Dana dropped off says, okay. Since by law every unit is allowed an ADU, how does this zoning, zoning change interact with ADU's requirements? There's no mention of requiring any public notices or right to appeal changes to neighbors or interested parties. Okay. Um, so the ADU requirements for Brisbane are in Chapter 17.43 of the zoning ordinance, we aren't recommending any changes to those requirements, so pertain to size and access from a roadway and utility access and owner occupancy requirements. Those would all stay the same if someone elected um, to construct affordable units as ADUs. 
So I, I don't know without more specific clarification on the question if. Well, the project, to it. any project that is, if it's going to be a for sale product, it's going to be a subdivision or a map of some type that's subject to planning commission review. And they would have to do a affordable housing plan, which is subject to planning commission review. And the issue of how the affordable housing is going to be achieved, whether it's through ADU or other means, would be addressed as part of that plan, so it would be subject to planning commission review. And, and what have you already hoped? And in terms of multiple family zoning, we don't allow ADUs in multiple family zones. For, but yes, we do. For multiple family, you can have a, a single family a single residence. single family home yes, in a multiple family I mean. zone, yeah. But you can't have a, an apartment building and have an ADU with your, for each apartment in your... But if you own a house and you wanted an ADU, do you have to notify your neighbors that you're doing this or anything? No. That's not, it's not a conditional use and it, there's no notification procedures right now for ADUs. Which, which would be consistent, correct me if I'm wrong, if, if you were doing an addition on a house, right? It'd be, yeah, you don't it, have to accessory do dwelling units are accessory to the main house, so there's no, I, I think maybe in the past when we required use permits for accessory dwelling units, there was a noticing component because it was a use permit that okay. went to the commission, but okay. there's no noticing now. It's ministerial. Okay. Any further comments? I think we tried our best to address most of what was raised here tonight. Commissioner Mackin, you have something so else? So how difficult would it be looking at the number of projects that have been built in Brisbane to make a suggestion that if a project comes through requesting a density bonus that it goes before a public hearing well again that would be a project of five or more units which a project of that size in Brisbane in any multifamily zone or commercial zone that allows such development requires a design permit so that would be coming to you to the, the public as a public hearing for the design permit and then if they needed any other depending on the project any other permits it would go to a public hearing okay any other comments or questions okay well then um do i have a motion I'll move for the commission to approve resolution RZ-5-18 as recommended by the staff. In a second? I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. Okay, it passes. Next topic is items initiated by staff. Well, Madam Chair, you may want to just read the appeal period, oh. our appeal for the benefit of the audience. Do that. Okay, anyone may appeal the action of the Planning Commission to the City Council. Except where specified otherwise, appeal shall be filed with the City Clerk not later than 15 calendar days following the Planning Commission's decision. Exceptions to the 15-day filing period include the following. Appeal shall be filed with the City Clerk within six calendar days of the Commission's action for use permits and variances and 10 calendar days for tentative maps and advertising sign. An application form and fees required to file for an appeal. Okay. Next item is uh, items initiated by staff. Um, just a couple things. The city council did talk about cannabis businesses at their last meeting um, in terms of looking at the regulations and they're looking at it at a council subcommittee right now. And if they do come back with some sort of direction uh, as a council as a whole and refer back to you, you may be seeing some, some potential revisions to the regulations. We'll see how that goes. And then the other thing is on May 4th, we're having another one of our uh, community conversations, similar to what we had in March. So we'd encourage all the commissioners to attend. I know we had several members at the last um, conversation. I hope it was useful and interesting, and we're hoping to have another a really good conversation on the 4th. I don't have the time. I think it's going to be mid-afternoon, but you'll be seeing some, uh, some um, uh, publication and, and advertisement of the notice and the date as soon once it's pinned down. That's all I had. Thank you. Items initiated by the commission. We have none. Okay. Excuse me. Oh, 
I just had a question yes. for staff. Um, since we're aware that there was legislation pending in Sacramento regarding arena exemptions for Brisbane that have to do with the Baylands, just for the record, could we say, is there an update on that? I have no information to offer you. I apologize. Okay. Mr. Ray Miller, you'd like to speak? Okay. Yes, please. This is just an informational item. Um, I'm not going to pursue anything that's already been decided. Um, if you're interested in uh, a statewide group that's concerned with local democracy and uh, local control and tries to keep up to date on all of the pending legislation and the implications thereof, uh, and also an opportunity for political involvement like uh, Commissioner Mackin mentioned, uh, the group is uh, Livable California, uh, and I think uh, you can get uh, their uh, chat room or whatever you call it, which produces a lot of stuff every day. Uh, it's called Livable California Sharing at googlegroups.com, and I think it's very instructive. I don't agree with everything that comes up there, but uh, this is a statewide effort to try to counter the, the state mandates uh, that are one size fits all. Uh, and I think just speaking to the suggestion of you know, political involvement, I think you're right that uh, that's the only way things are going to happen and people mobilize. Uh, and this is, uh, so far as I know anyway, this is the most active statewide group. So just bring that to your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think that concludes it for tonight. Can I have a motion for us to adjourn until the regular next regular meeting of April twenty? Yeah. Oh, did you have it? I did. Oh, well, that's okay. Come on, Barbara. Please. Yeah, I was just going to say I wanted to apologize to Julia because I spot checked the old table and it seemed like every one I picked out was like 19, 20, and 21 percent. Um, so I, yeah, I, I was aware that the table did vary. Um, I just, I didn't realize we were that far. Um, I knew we were doing this to reply, comply with the state. I didn't realize we were that, that had been pending that long. Um, and I just wanted to, I was going to just, I raised my hand before you guys um, closed the comment, but I was just going to throw out there the possibility of, um, had you considered doing something like state plus 3% so that you were, you could refer back to the state table so hopefully you didn't get caught up in every, every change you know, and have to change your ordinance every time the state changed something, but to set a, a somewhat higher bar. Because I, I do feel like a lot of that tape, I know there, the table was all over the place, but I kind of feel like 15% is a little less than um, what the old table represented overall. And um, I think we could have done a little better. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Okay, can I have a motion for us to adjourn to the next regular meeting of April 25th, 2019? I make a motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.